I have a question for you. Just how intimate are you with the term biodiversity? Do you know how biodiversity and climate change are different and how they're connected? An article from The Guardian reported that only 13% of people think that they can explain biodiversity to a friend. So whether you're passionate about science communication like me and want to make sure that you are up to date on your knowledge about biodiversity, or if you just want to enrich your understanding of nature to be able to talk about current events, let me tell you the seven things that I think are worth remembering about biodiversity. So first I have to tell you a short story on how I became so endeared with the term biodiversity. So it was the first semester of my freshman year at KU and I had just gotten out of my Spanish class it was a warm, sunny day, and I decided I didn't want to go home yet. So I stopped into the study abroad office, and serendipitously, the first person I talked to, their name was Quinn, and they had studied abroad in Costa Rica. They were super pumped about the program, and I was like, I'm all in. I didn't even consider any other programs. They told me there were a lot of scholarships available, so I worked all of spring semester on applying for those scholarships. I got a few of them, and my friends and family were also kind enough to raise money for me to get to go to Costa Rica. I thought it would be a good idea to go right after my freshman year because I thought it would help me grow and gain confidence. Little did I know that journey would take a little bit longer than I expected, but nevertheless, I had some ups and downs that made me stronger. I started this journal when I first got there and it does a really good job at explaining just how tumultuous my experience was. From the 1st of July, a Sunday, in Manuel Antonio State Park. I have a, a journal entry where I have an injury count and an animal count. On my injury count, I had an infected wisdom tooth socket with a swollen cheek, it was ginormous, a bruised pelvis, knees, butt, sore neck and shoulders from surfing, leftover bug bites and blisters from the last weekend where I had walked in my sandals in the ocean and then they rubbed on my feet and then I got ocean water in it and it hurt a lot. I had weird pimples on top of my shoulders, I think from the sun, and period cramps. It was just pretty miserable. <laughs> but at the same time, I saw a lot of incredible animals. We could see toucans out of the front porch of our Airbnb, sloths, a bunch of iguanas, hermit crab, birds, three different kinds of monkeys, more sloths, raccoons, and a lot of cockroaches in our Airbnb. Pretty soon my classes started at the University of Costa Rica and I got to take yoga, GMOs, textiles, landscape ecology, and biodiversity of Costa Rica in Spanish. From Saturday the 25th of August, I met the rest of the Ecología del Paisaje class at the university, then we all drove to Cartago. We took a few stops to get out and take data. I was a bit overwhelmed by my lack of knowledge of species and landscape vocabulary. We got to the park and sat to eat lunch. A really cute animal that I didn't know the name of was running around. The volcano was super cold and my hands were numb. The lagoon's color was stunning. It was so gray and foggy that every color the greenery, the lake, the flowers really popped. The fog rolling in was magical. Another really tumultuous experience that I had was my birthday. It was really incredible because I got to see whales for the very first time, but I was also very lonely, so it was a very conflicting experience. <laughs> But my classmates got me a birthday cake and my professors taught me how to dance. We were playing music out of the van that we had driven to the research station in and it was just an incredible time. I wrote, at 8 a.m. we met in the biology parking lot. We drove towards Cartago and stopped at the Quetzales Lodge to see the hummingbirds. We stopped for casados at a place with an amazing view. Casados are like the typical meal. The place we stayed at had a bunch of bunk beds, a biology research reserve. We went on a night walk, saw so many frogs and sloths, bats, a caiman, and a cohort of lizards. Twenty biologists are greater than one guide. 
The next day, we woke up to go to the whale watching place. We waited for a while on the beach, which was beautiful. There was a sandbar in the shape of a whale tail, which you walk on to, to load the boats, and the water is like a mirror. We found a bunch of sand dollars, and then we saw a, a whale mom with her young and a whole group of eight males. They were so magical. Saturday, the 29th of September. Sad, happy day. Took the van to National Park with Ecología del Paisaje. We took a stop to talk about protected land in Costa Rica, then did a walk through the park in the afternoon. Started raining buckets. I put my backpack cover on to protect all my stuff, but I didn't bring an umbrella into the rainforest. Water pooled inside my backpack cover and gave my phone and camera a bath. My phone was already vulnerable and cracked from the day before. I tried not to worry about it. We went for a walk and we saw a glass frog for the first time and a drana toro, which is a huge frog that meows under stress. It was just super big and chunky. My classmates had also set up nets that bats can't detect with their echolocation, so they get trapped in the net. I got to pet some bats and I wrote that I love being an amateur biologist, even if it means destroying my technology. It's pretty symbolic that I stopped writing in my journal after this last entry. It was actually Thanksgiving day, and I had gone to a coffee shop and then had Thanksgiving dinner by myself. And then I was waiting outside for my Uber and my phone got stolen right out of my hands. And yes, by the way, that was the replacement phone for the one that had gotten cracked and then soaked in the rainforest. So it was a crazy time. There were a lot of ups and downs, but obviously I wouldn't trade it for anything. I'm super grateful that I got to have the experience to walk in such a beautiful place with people that were so knowledgeable and passionate. But in all honesty, my professors and peers here at the University of Kansas are equally as wonderful and knowledgeable. Here at KU, I've gotten to take Intro to Ecology, which was a surprising amount of math, and Field Ecology with the Environmental Studies Department. So now that you know why I'm so passionate about biodiversity, let me tell you the first thing that I think is worth remembering. When you put all of life on Earth into context, you quickly learn that humans are very fresh on the scene. I remember the first day of my Biodiversity of Costa Rica class, we all were guessing how many species we thought were on this planet, and I was so shocked to hear that there's an estimated up to one trillion species alive on this planet today. Of that trillion species, only 1.3 million of them are described, and we as human beings are just one species out of those millions and trillions of species. And 99.9% .9 of species that have ever existed on Earth are now extinct. Here's another way to put into context just how new humans are to life on Earth and the universe. The cosmic calendar basically scales the entirety of the universe from the Big Bang to the present moment on a calendar year from the 1st of January to the last minute of the last day of December. It's not until September of the calendar year that life even arose on Earth. The 28th of December is when flowers even arose, and the last day of the year is when humans evolved. The last minute of the last day is when we can find the entirety of our archeological and written record of human beings. So the species alive today are really just a small snapshot of all of the life that has existed on Earth. So you might be wondering why so many species have gone extinct, why we're even here today, and I'll get to that. But first, I need to explain what diversity even means. The way I remember it is that diversity equals resilience. In my intro to ecology class, they showed a diagram that looked a lot like this, and I remember that being the moment that biodiversity just clicked in my head. Basically, in food web A, you see a lot more biodiversity, and in food web B, there's lower biodiversity. In food web A, if you remove just one species, the leafhopper, then the things that usually eat the leafhopper will still have other things to eat, and the food web will remain relatively stable. But in food web B, if you lose just that one species, the leafhopper, then the entire ecosystem is on the verge of collapse. So basically, diversity is just how many backups there are on the food web and how resilient that ecosystem is to the loss of a single species. 
The point of preserving resilience is to avoid the point of collapse in a system. This has really changed our understanding about how biodiversity loss and climate change work on our planet. Every system has a tipping point, whether that be the ice glaciers melting or ecosystems losing their resilience. But diversity is not just on the food web scale, it's also on the scale of genes, entire species, communities, and ecosystems. It's good to have a variety of species that replace the function of one lost species, but it's also important to have genetic diversity or the ability for an entire species to adapt to environmental changes. I wanted to share that diversity equals resilience is also something that I hold very strongly in my personal life. I believe that a diversity of perspectives will always strengthen a group and make it more resilient. Here's another way of thinking of your perspective on biodiversity. Do you have more of an intrinsic value or a utilitarian value placed on nature? By that I mean, when you think about why you care about nature, do you just like to know that the woods behind your childhood home still exist, even if you don't plan on going back there? The American Natural History Museum defines this as an inalienable right to exist, thinking that nature should just exist just because it does. Or do you have more of a utilitarian value on nature? Do you understand nature for what it provides? Medicine, carbon fixation, food, pollination, raw material, water purification, control of pests, nutrient cycling, and so on and so on. Chances are that your philosophy, religion, politics, life experience all contribute to whether you have an intrinsic or utilitarian value placed on nature and biodiversity. But you're probably a lot like me and have a mixture of both. So we tend to focus a lot on diversity, but I want you to remember that bio matters too. Oftentimes when we hear the phrase biodiversity loss and talking about deforestation or the fires in the Amazon or Australia, we're thinking about clearing out an entire patch of forest which removes all of the biodiversity and all of the organisms living there. But we don't hear too much about something that's actually equally as important just because of how commonly it occurs. That's the degradation of just one tier of the food web, one trophic level, which can cause what is known as a trophic cascade. I'll give you an example from my field ecology course where we got to sample stream invertebrates from all over the city. Basically, if you have disturbance to a stream, whether that be wastewater contamination or agricultural runoff, that might not kill all of the invertebrates in a stream, but it will significantly reduce their overall abundance. Stream invertebrates are often filter feeders, meaning that they're pretty low on the food chain and a relatively important trophic level. If stream invertebrates are reduced in abundance, this can have a cascading effect on the fish that usually eat them, and then the birds, the bats, and then the entire ecosystem. In other words, even if an ecosystem retains the diversity or richness of species, if the abundance of just one trophic level or group reduces, then this can have an overall weakening effect on the entire ecosystem. I said that ecology is a surprising amount of math, and here's an example. The Shannon Diversity Index is one way of calculating biodiversity. You can see that it's not only accounting for the number of species, but also the number of individuals found in both species. So abundance and richness are both key factors in understanding biodiversity. When you first thought about biodiversity, you might have thought about the poster children of endangered species. But let me give you a couple of examples on why endangered species protection isn't what you think it is. When the Endangered Species Act was passed in 1973, Congress was probably imagining these kinds of species. They're likable, charismatic, even cute, and you'd be really sad to think that they're not on this earth anymore. But since the Endangered Species Act was adopted, the numbers of species protected has risen dramatically, something that Congress probably wasn't expecting. Of course, this is in part due to the fact that more and more species have been evaluated, but it's also because ecosystem conditions are undeniably worsening and more species need to be protected. Here's the first group of species to remember to broaden your understanding of endangered species protection. These are known as keystone species. One classic example is sea otters, and this goes back to trophic cascades. So imagine an ecosystem with sea otters, urchins, and kelp. Sea otters are one of the only species that can keep sea urchins in check. 
Without sea otters there, urchins just proliferate out of control, destroy the kelp forests, and then weaken the entire ecosystem that relies on the kelp because kelp are primary producers of their habitat. If you're not too familiar with marine ecosystems, beavers might be a better example to remember. They are keystone species, although they're thankfully not endangered. Beavers are keystone species because they are ecosystem engineers, meaning that they physically build habitats by changing the hydrology of their ecosystem. If they were removed, their entire ecosystem would change dramatically and possibly even collapse. That's the idea of a keystone, the last stone placed in an arc that if it were removed, that whole arc would collapse, as you can see in that little figure. But there's another category of critters that you might not think about right away, and neither did Congress. These are less charismatic species, maybe small, and only live in one specific region. Fireflies are a species facing the threat of extinction due to pesticides and light pollution. But how are you supposed to protect an insect? Well, you have to focus on a bigger scale, make their whole entire habitat better. Turn off lights, leave leaf litter in your yard rather than picking it up in yard bags, plant native trees, and avoid pesticide use. By saving one species, we're often by extension preserving their entire habitats, the animals and plants that live alongside them. It's true that endangered species protection is sometimes raising an individual animal in captivity or tracking an individual elephant, prohibiting hunting of that species, but commonly it's things like reducing waste, pollution, and just preserving the land they live on. In a way, endangered species protection is just one facet of preserving ecosystem resilience. So we talked about the importance of biodiversity, but it's also important to remember where and why that biodiversity occurs. The key to understanding that is the role of disturbance. A lot of biodiversity exists near the equator where environmental conditions are pretty stable. In fact, 60% of the world's terrestrial life lives on just 2.6% of the land surface area. Why is this near the equator? Well, it's warmer. More energy in the system means more competition, more speciation, taller trees, more habitat, and more niches. Costa Rica, for example, is also a land bridge connecting the northern and southern hemisphere. Animals migrate across Costa Rica seasonally each year, but also over evolutionary time as glaciers have expanded and receded across North America. So the tropics are pretty warm and stable, allowing life to flourish. But on a smaller scale, we see a different pattern, more of a Goldilocks scenario. Local diversity is greatest when disturbance is not too frequent or too rare. This is known as the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. An example of this and something that I like to do in my own time is to do prairie burns with some of my favorite people. Prairie should be burned once every few years. This gives enough time so that the species that are there can really establish, grow nice roots, but the burning is important to allow that ecosystem to regenerate, to allow colonizing species to populate, to enrich the soil, and to sort of test the genetic diversity of the species living there. Generally, on a genetic level, a little bit of stress is important for speciation. Basically, this tests genetic diversity and makes sure that a population is staying adaptable and resilient to environmental changes. But sometimes species just can't react quickly enough to environmental changes, and when that happens, you have a mass extinction. Unfortunately, and I hate to be the one to break this to you, but we are currently undergoing Earth's sixth mass extinction. Don't panic. Extinctions happen slowly sometimes, but do be concerned. Usually when this happens, there is an evolutionary bottleneck where after the mass extinction, life on Earth just goes in a completely different direction. So what would happen if humans went extinct? Well, probably things that we know of as pests and weeds, which are really hardy, will diversify and flourish into something really beautiful and unrecognizable to us. If that makes you sad, well, might be something to think about. <laughs> this is a really great book that I read that just walks through the history of discoveries that have helped us understand how extinctions happen here on Earth. For a while, we didn't even realize that the Earth has indeed changed over time. 
guys like Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin sounded crazy to their peers when they explained that the Earth has indeed changed over time, geologically, environmentally, and the slow evolution of life over generations. The fact that the Earth can change quite quickly was also a shock to the world. The fact that species could even disappear entirely or go extinct was a groundbreaking discovery by the infamous George Cuvier, who is an anatomist and all-around sketchy guy. Read the book if you want to learn more about that. Mass extinctions are really interesting to me because they're basically systems that spin out of balance over time. This causes environmental changes that are hostile to life. But these are all systems that still occur on Earth, just on a smaller scale and within balance. Or sometimes an asteroid hits the Earth and there's really nothing you can do about it. Okay, so remember, 3.5 billion years ago is when life first arose on Earth. It took its sweet, sweet time to proliferate, and then by 445 million years ago, Earth was ready for its first mass extinction of 85% of species. This was called the Ordovician extinction. This was sparked by an intense ice age due to plants proliferating, fixing carbon dioxide, and cooling the Earth. Basically the opposite of what's happening now on Earth as we remove greenery on Earth, warming it up. That extinction happened over millions of years, which is still relatively short. The next extinction was a late Devonian extinction, which killed off 75% of species. They think that this happened because of a drastic drop in oxygen, perhaps due to algal blooms, which is something that often happens in lakes today on Earth. The next extinction was the deadliest. The Permian extinction killed off 96% of life on Earth. This happened because of global warming. Carbon dioxide was emitted from volcanoes and methane from bacteria, which are some of the same greenhouse gases that we're emitting today. Next was the Triassic extinction, which killed off 80% of species, possibly due to ocean acidification after volcanic activity. Basically, the carbon dioxide emitted from volcanoes turns into acid in water. Carbon dioxide is really bad for our ocean because when it turns into acid, it degrades the shells of a lot of living organisms and corals. At the Triassic extinction, most mammals died off, leaving room for dinosaurs to pro proliferate. Then the next extinction, the most well known, is when those dinosaurs went all but extinct except for birds. This happened 66 million years ago and 60 to 70 percent of all life was lost. This happened because of an impact of an asteroid in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Basically debris exploded, first raining embers which fell and caused a bunch of fires across the globe. Then the debris basically shaded the earth causing it to cool and then there was a bunch of other natural disasters like tsunamis that happened from the impact of the asteroid. So how do we know that we are experiencing the sixth extinction? Sadly, extinctions are occurring right now thousands of times greater than what we call the background extinction rate or the extinction of species just due to natural processes. Global warming and biodiversity loss due to human activity have increased extinction rates by many orders of magnitude. So that's all pretty depressing, but I like to retain just a little bit of hope. So here are some things that we can do to give our Earth a fighting chance. First of all, you can support local farms. This is great on so many levels, one of those levels being that local farms tend to preserve more biodiversity. You can also reduce your carbon footprint and make sure you're supporting environmental policies that you believe in both on the federal level and on the local level. You can support restoration and conservation. This is something that I had no idea how it actually worked until I took my landscape ecology course. To be honest, I didn't even know what landscape ecology meant until the class started. I just took it because I was told we were gonna go on trips and all the other foreign exchange students were taking it too. But basically what I learned is that the geography and composition of habitats can be as important overall as building individual habitats such as for keystone species. On the figure to the left, you can see the dark patches, which is something like maybe a national park or a preserved patch of land. But it's also really important to have these corridors or stepping stones between these patches so that species can migrate safely. The corridor might even just be a stream that has trees around it that runs between the Hobby Lobby and the Home Depot. 
That map on the right was actually one of my exams. We were given the blue areas, which are already conserved, and we had to decide where to put the corridors, which I highlighted in green. Basically, we had to take into account what the landscape was like there. Are there buildings there or are there farms? Because it's a lot less expensive to convert a farm to a corridor than it is to try to cut down buildings or houses, which probably isn't even ethical. But when you compare this ideal scenario of patches connected by corridors to how the United States looks, it's a little bit of a different story. If you look at this map, you can see that conserved areas in the United States actually follow a gradient of colonization across the United States. As the colonizers were marching along, they realized that there were some beautiful landscapes in the United States that they didn't have back in Europe. So they took the opportunity to preserve some national parks. Because of the way this played out, one of the most biodiverse areas of our country, which is actually in Florida, really isn't protected as intensively as it should be. Then if you compare the map of the United States to Costa Rica, you see how Costa Rica has a lot more protection and it's a little bit more evenly distributed. A quarter of Costa Rica's land is protected. This is in part due to the fact that they rely a lot on tourism, so they have a lot of value placed on conserving their land. There's also a cultural value and a lot of scientists who understand the value of biodiversity. So there is hope for our Earth as long as we listen to our scientists. Okay, so that's a lot of information, and I hope that I explained it in a way that you can remember some of it. Now let's take a moment and listen to a poem by one of my favorite podcasters and philosophers that writes a lot of poetry that I resonate with on human beings' relationship with nature. There are a finite number of elements in the universe, a finite number of forces, of energies, in time, in certain proportions, they gave rise to moss, to galaxies, to you. How sweet are the limitations of this place. How lovely to be one note in such a rich, unlikely song. <laughs>